Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be asked as the most moderate person here to moderate this first, um, this first panel. Um, the conservative, the moral and philosophical basis of liberty. Well, um, Michael Miller, our lead speaker on this panel, is the chief, chief of strategic initiatives and senior research fellow at the Acton Institute. And he's interested in and has written on entrepreneurial solutions to poverty. He writes and speaks widely on the intersection between moral philosophy, theology, economics, and culture. And he's going to talk to us mainly, I think, about anthropology. How do we think about the, how we think about the human person, he will argue, uh, really decides uh, how we then think about politics and economics. Uh, and we are, I think he will argue, in some kind of anthropological struggle um, between different versions of anthropology, in other words, between true and false. Well, Mr. Miller is therefore the ideal speaker to kick off on this vital but complex topic. Now, this is his first visit to Croatia. So we specially laid on ideal climatic conditions. We All we need now is another earthquake. So welcome, Mr. Miller. Alex Chafuin is Managing Director International of the Acton Institute, and he's a good friend to Tsok. He spoke at our summer university in Split, and those who listened to him, it's no exaggeration to say, were inspired as well as informed. Uh, he is a, a top-class economist. He speaks on that subject, but also on the security and strategic threats in Latin America. And like his colleague, Mr. Miller, he concentrates on the relationship between economics and ethics. He also has one extra claim to receive a warm welcome from all of you, because Alex Chafuan has Croatian roots. The Acton Institute is very important to all of us who call ourselves conservatives, who are also free marketeers, and who practice our religion. Uh, the Acton Institute is named after the famous Victorian liberal historian Lord Acton, who was both a Catholic uh, and a liberal. And Acton's mission, uh, I quote, is to promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. So. This is particularly important because here in Croatia, in my view, as in other traditional Catholic countries, there is a feeling among the theologians that economics is really too vulgar and materialistic to bother with, uh, and uh, that only a question or a, a quotation or two from some um, garbled papal encyclical will do the trick. On the other hand, there are those who are seriously uh, committed to and want to find free market solutions, but these often think that religion and philosophy has nothing to teach them, and both these groups are wrong. The third member of our panel, as they say, needs no introduction, President of uh, Tsok, member of the Sabo for Domovinsky Pokret, Stiepo. Now, um, Stiepo and I have known each other since 1996. Stiepo, I should remind some of you, because it isn't always said, actually came here when Croatia uh, still looked as if it might not become a secure state at all, let alone one that was in control of its own territory. And so whatever we can say is that whereas there are some, shall we say, opportunistic patriots, a step was certainly not one of them. Uh, he, uh, with my involvement, founded TSOC in 2009. Uh, TSOC is still the only conservative think tank in Croatia. Uh, we do not receive a penny of government money, for better and for worse. Uh, but I can tell those who hope otherwise that we're not going to go away any time soon. Well, Mr. Miller, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris, and uh, all for the 
the very um, kind uh, welcome and invitation. I'm delighted to be uh, here in Croatia for my first time. Um, I've always seen beautiful pictures of the beaches, and so I came to Zagreb when it was 95 degrees. Uh, but I'm really delighted and honored to be here, and and so far I'm working on my Croatian. At the end, I will order coffee for you in Croatia. <clears throat> so, um, so my talk, as Mr. Harris said, is on uh, the human person as the center of the economy. I think, do I have a PowerPoint here? Okay, if not, it's okay. I have a PowerPoint that may show up. If the PowerPoint does not show up, I'm going to tell you now, this is the greatest PowerPoint you will ever see. Okay? If it does, if it shows up, then you'll see it's quite mediocre. All right. Get this out of the way. Do we have it? All right. Is it coming? Okay. So, uh, so it's okay. It's okay. All right. So um, I'm going to talk today about the human person at the center of the economy and society. And argue that we are, in fact, in an anthropological struggle over what it means to be a human person, and that at the core of our debates on politics and economics and culture is really this vision of what it means to be a human person. <clears throat> John Paul II uh, argued that socialism, the primary error of socialism, was anthropological in nature. That is, it got the human person wrong. Now, this can sometimes surprise us because we, we tend to think about, um, we tend to think about, um, about socialism as merely an economic idea. And I think you especially see this in the United States and Western Europe, where we identified socialism as simply an economic idea, the abolition of private property and state ownership of the means of production. But if we read Marx and the socialists clearly and correctly, it is, it is much more than an economic vision. It is a deep sociological and vision of the human person. <clears throat> so I would argue that what we're seeing is a lot of uneasiness about what it means to be a human person. Gaudium et Spes, the, the Catholic Vatican II document, says we're buffeted between hope and anxiety, pressing one another with questions and burdened down with uneasiness. And I would argue that the core of this uneasiness is what does it mean to be a human person? And I would say that we are inundated currently with two senses of philosophy. On one side, a certain type of utopianism, which I'll talk about, transhumanism. We're going to upload our brains to the internet. We're going to move to Mars, right? We're going to live forever. And on the other side, a certain type of nihilism and despair. Um, that, well, let's just give everyone a universal basic income, give them marijuana to smoke, Netflix TV to watch, and then they can just kind of fade away into nothing. And so both of these are really theologies or anti-theologies of despair. <clears throat> and they lead to cultural and social disorder, to technocracy, and ultimately to a culture of death. And so I would argue that the root response, which I'll talk about towards the end, is that we need to propose a rich, authentic, morally serious, and intellectually serious Catholic anthropology that takes, that takes seriously our embodied, embedded, and spiritual nature in a way that all of the dominant philosophies of the person do not. So uh, what I'd like to do is divide my talk into two parts. Uh, the main part is I'm going to outline five false anthropologies, five anthropologies that are dominant today that are an error. Okay. And then the second thing I'll do is talk very briefly about somehow some characteristics of Catholic anthropology uh, can help us resolve these false anthropologies, and also how this then relates to our understanding of politics and, the econ and economics. So the first false anthropology that's increasingly influential today, it could be called plastic anthropology. Right. Actually, th is it going to come up or no? No. No. Okay. Ah, that makes the world a much better place. Okay. So the first one um, that, that is plastic anthropology, and this could be called in very complex philosophical terms, a new ontology of the person, a new metaphysics of the human person. 
Um, and this is most evident in the sexual sphere, but it will also feeds into transhumanism that I will discuss. So one way to understand plastic anthropology is this. In the Aristotelian kind of traditional Catholic understanding, uh, human beings have an essence. We're a certain kind of thing, okay? A certain kind of being. We have a nature, okay? Now, each of us is free, unique, and unrepeatable. So we have ability to create ourselves, <coughs> to decide what we're going to do with our lives. Um, but but that that creation of ourself, of course, is limited or within an essence, just like a river has banks that makes it a river. So to the human being is a certain kind of thing. Now, you saw in the 20th century, the existentialist movement, people like Jean-Paul Sartre and others argued there's no essence or nature. We just have raw existence. We can just do what we want. Okay. Um, now, the problem is this raw existence may enable us to do whatever we want, but it doesn't give us any rights. And so what we've seen in plastic anthropology is almost an inversion of a classical understanding. We start with raw essence, oh, sorry, raw existence, raw existence. We just are free to do whatever we want. And then we can choose our essence. And this especially is we get to choose whether we're LGBTQ or A. And we choose what we are. And when we choose what we are, the plastic hardens. And that becomes who you are. Okay? Now, this is important. Because who you are is more important than what you believe. So think of it this way. Where a Catholic would say a man has same-sex attraction, the new plastic ontology says a man is a homosexual. With transgenderism, if a man identifies as a woman, the new plastic anthropology says a man is a woman. And therefore, he must be able to use a woman's bathroom. He must be able to play women's sports because that's who he is. Okay. Now, while sexual identity is the most um, obvious issue, this plastic anthropology goes far beyond this. And I also want to say these are complex problems. Okay. Many people are suffering. Many people who are struggling with these problems of gender dysphoria are actually victims of the sexual revolution. Many of them have been abused, right? And so this is not to, 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 in a sense, discount complexity, but the new ontology of the person reduces the person simply to the problem they have. Now think about this. We would never say to a young woman struggling with anorexia, that's who you are. Just don't eat until you die. We would never do that. But in the sexual sphere, we have turned the, the, the personal experience into their identity. Okay. Now, this is a problem in a couple of ways. Beyond the fact that a person can choose his identity, we now enter into the realm of propaganda and la layers of abuse. Because as the great C.S. Lewis said, Man's power over nature is always some men's power over other men. So if a young man or woman can choose their identity, what does that stop a person with power to force identity, to redefine people as non-persons? And this, as we know from the 20th century, and we're going to talk about crimes of communism tomorrow, we know the 20th century is filled with fascist and communist governments redefining people out of personhood. And so this plastic anthropology is not only a problem in the individual level, it's a problem in the political level. Now, the other thing is that dignity... So the other, the other problem with this is a, another political problem. The second problem is a political problem. Dignity is something that many Catholics are com comfortable with. Okay, each of us has human dignity. We like the term dignity. We use the term dignity. But what we're seeing is that dignity is being used as a weapon 
against religious liberty. So if your sexual predilection is who you are, that's who you are, that's your identity, that's your dignity. And so who you are, as I said, is more important than what you hold. That's why it's a quote unquote, a violation of dignity to, for example, deny sacraments of marriage to someone who identifies as a woman who's a man. Because what you hold, your religious beliefs are not as important as who you are. And so we're seeing dignity being used as a weapon against religious liberty. And this, in fact, it's, it's still not fully there. But if you look at the Yogyakarta principles of the United Nations, German law, South African law, and a number of other places, you're, you're seeing this, de this development of, you're seeing this development of dignity being used as a weapon against religious liberty. So in the state of Michigan, where I live, a constitutional amendment was just passed in the state of Michigan, all right, that says that abortion is a constitutional right, even for minors. And all sexual surgeries, everything are constitutional rights. And parents have no consent or notification required. So it is a constitutional right in the state of Michigan, in the United States, for a child to have an abortion or gender surgery without letting the parents know. Okay, so this is coming down into law right now. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is a problem we have to address. And as you well know, this is not just an American problem. Um, plastic anthropology is part of an international agenda. The, it is what Pope Francis has called ideological colonization. And you can look at the LGBTQ flag flown by the United States and European governments all over the world. So that's the first problem, this new ontology of the person. The second and related is transhumanism. Now, transhumanism is complex, and I can only touch on it. But transhumanism basically is connected to advances in digital technology and synthetic bi biology like gene editing. I would argue that in many ways, um, transhumanism is really a late stage Gnostic ideology. Okay, so it's kind of a recurring Gnostic view that sees the body as something to be escaped from. So the transhumanist believes that the human being in our current form is just at an early stage of development, right? And that what, what we're going to do is we're going to combine with technology to become a new kind of being, a cyborg, right? And we're going to evolve into a new uh, kind uh, of being. As one transhumanist put it, if we want to live in paradise, we have to engineer it ourselves. Does that sound familiar? Does that, that sound like a communist idea? Okay. If we want eternal life, then we have to rewrite our bug-ridden genetic code and become godlike. Only high-tech solutions can ever eradicate suffering from the world, end quote. So simply, transhumanism is the idea of combining biology and technology to create a new human being. All right. Now, there's a lot of things I could talk about there. Um, you see things, um, for example, um, with... And there's some positives, right? There's some positive elements like able to solve problems with hearing and with sight, right? Um, CRISPR technology, which is gene editing technology, has been used positively to help cure sickle cell anemia in adults, right? So there's some positive elements to it. But the transhumanist idea is not like a, a, a Catholic or a traditionalist idea of restoring health. It's, it's rather a radical transformation. Okay. Um, for example, as you probably know, uh, in 2018, a Chinese scientist edited the genes of two twin girl embryos to make them resistant to the HIV virus. And these two girls were born. Okay. They're alive. This is the beginning of designer babies, ladies and gentlemen. This is a eugenics vision of the world where the idea is that a parent can choose the height, the eye color, the musculature, et cetera. Okay. They're working on creating artificial wombs and trying to create babies from the genetic material of homosexual couples. So designer babies is really an extreme example of what Pope Francis calls a consumerist attitude. But I want you to think about this for a minute. If scientists in embryo, which is already a grave evil, can make little girls, little embryo girls, HIV resistant, 
What if scientists decide, because remember in China, millions and millions of girls have been murdered. They've been aborted, right? Same with India, same across the world. We are have huge population dis disorder because of bad policies. So what happens when there's few women? Do women become precious? No, women become commodities. So now ask yourself a question. If the scientists can make them HIV resistant, why not make them gonorrhea resistant and syphilis resistant and sterile so that they become sex slaves? And we know sex slavery is a real thing. And this whole eugenic view, this, my friends, is not conspiracy theory. I wish it was science fiction, but billions of dollars are being spent on these things. So we have a very serious uh, problem. Um, <clears throat> and right now there's a moratorium on gene editing, but it will not last. There's another part of transhumanism, which is the idea of aspirational, that we're going to upload ourselves to the internet. You might have heard this. There are some people who think we can, we can upload our brains to the internet and live forever. Now, again, this may sound like science fiction, but billions of dollars are being put into these ideas of transhumanist life extension. Now, the problems with it are many, and I cannot get into them, but a one question we should ask ourselves. Everybody thinks that we're just our brain and a body, but that's bad Descartes, okay? It's, it's like mutant, what, what has been called mutant Cartesianism by, these, uh, by a philosopher, uh, a hacker. And we have to ask ourselves, like, who is the self that has a brain? This hyper-reductionist vision of the person, this materialism, is creating deep distortions that we think we're just our brains. And it's a rejection of our embodied nature. Okay. But I want to say again, these are ideas are not the future. There's a very famous um, transgender transhumanist named Martin Roblot. It's a man who, who has technologically changed himself into a woman. That's not possible, but that's what he, he does. Okay. And his book is endorsed by Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil is the head of artificial intelligence at Google. Okay. These are not like crazy ideas. I mean, they're crazy ideas. Sorry. <laughs> These are very problematic ideas, but they are not like out of the mainstream. Um, people like Yuval Harari, who is, who is read and cited by President Obama, by Mark Zuckerberg. They're, the transhumanist movement is alive and well. And it's important to, to, to note that transgenderism is a subset of transhumanism. Because what is transgenderism? It is the technological shifting of the person to try to change ourselves using technology. All right. And a lot of this, of course, as I've said, is very complex. There's, there's propaganda. There's indoctrination of children. There's sexual abuse. But nevertheless, trans, transgenderism is a subset of transhumanism because it's using biology to try to change the human being. And we're already acclimated to this. We're acclimated to this because we have been using contraceptives, birth control bill, and vasectomies for decades, which is just early stage transhumanism. And right, so these, this is a problem. Now, part of this, of course, is also a deep rejection of the feminine, of motherhood. It is what the Jewish convert to Catholicism psychiatrist Carl Stern has called flight from woman. And it's the consummation of the sexual revolution and the separation of sex from marriage. Wow. But it is indeed anti-woman. It rejects maternity. It rejects femininity. And it is in many ways a technological appropriation of woman. So this, okay. All right. So there we go. So that, this is very complex. There's a lot of things going on. Um, and I don't have time to get into them. But I think one way to understand transhumanism is that this is the new Tower of Babel. In the 20th century, the Tower of Babel was the, the Third Reich, right? The thousand year Reich, the communist paradise. The new Tower of Babel is man himself. We're going to use technology to make us into gods. And this is the new Tower of Babel. So this, that's the, 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 the second false anthropology. Number one is, uh, is the new ontology plastic anthropology. Number two is transhumanism. 
Let me move to number three. And by the way, I, I know I'm giving you a lot of information. I have handouts. If anyone would like a handout, you can email me. I, I had a slide to make it a little easier to follow, but I'm, I'm happy to give you a handout with lots of, of these notes. So if you're trying to remember something I said, just send me an email and I'll give you the handout with all the, with all the uh, data and links for that. So the third big problem for um, in, in anthropology is the idea as a human being as a cog. Now this in many ways is the dominant idea of the 20th century, right? Human beings simply exist for the collective estate. All right, we saw this extreme forms in the gulags and concentration camps. We see it in Chinese capitalism, right? We see it where the, the individual only exists for the good of the collective. And the collective means those who are in power. That's what it means. But we even see it in less extreme forms in industrial factories and farms with poor working conditions. We see it in World Economic Forum ethos. And we see it in the behavior modification that's practiced by big tech companies like Google and Facebook in alliance with the state to modify our behaviors and, and make us act in certain ways. So this whole idea of the human being is a cog. We even see it in the way we help the poor. Poor people are not subjects and protagonists of their own story of development. No, no, human beings, poor people are just problems to be socially engineered by technocrats in Washington, D.C. and Brussels. And so we have this false humanitarianism. So this idea of the cog, I think, is very straightforward, but it still is dominant and it affects people because if you're told constantly you're a cog, right, this has a psychological effect. We, it, it actually creates despair in people. So the fourth, then that's the third. So the fourth problem is that human beings are seen as a scourge. And here uh, we see this, especially in this deep environmentalism, right? Human beings are a problem for the planet. They're a problem for the environment. Uh, we have to have no population growth, no economic growth, because human beings are just a scourge on the planet, right? Uh, and of course, you, you know, one of the pictures I have is of the very famous young girl, Greta Thunberg, that I have here. And I'm not to mock her, right? We sometimes can mock her. But if you think about it, the, this is a problem. This poor young girl has been convinced through propaganda that somehow human beings are a problem. And you have, you have young ladies who are sterilizing themselves to not have children so they can save the planet. I mean, this is deeply problematic. I mean, young people are really being har harmed by this idea. And we're seeing all this propaganda, um, all this propaganda around um, population control. And part of this, of course, is just a problem in democratic society, right? In democratic society, we tend towards pantheism. We tend towards always looking at everything equal. The great French theorist Alexis de Tocqueville pointed this out. But pantheism saps the human spirit. So the deep, this deep ecology, human beings as a scourge, pantheist environmentalism isn't simply just care for the planet. Catholics and, and, and the whole tradition is to care for the planet. The, what happens instead is human beings are looked at as a problem. And this too, I would argue, is a theology of despair. And what we're seeing is people not having children. And when people do not have children, this breeds nihilism. It breeds despair, self-centeredness, and nihilism, right? When entire populations aren't having children because children help us see the possibilities even when our lives are difficult. Now, then that's the fourth. So the fifth, the final one that I want to talk about is really in many ways a summary of all the things that are happening. And this is what I would say is the human being as a commodity. Human beings are increasingly seen as simple commodities inside a kind of technocratic marketplace, right? Um, human beings are reduced to objects of trade. Now, I think the best way to understand this is through the work of the Italian Catholic philosopher named Augusto del Noce. Okay. His last name is del Noce. And, um, I usually have a picture because everybody says in Spanish is they get the night. Okay. Del Noce. Okay. Um, and he, he had this idea called the pure bourgeois. And so these are the things that have happened in modern economics that I think are really problematic and part of this 
idea of a person as a commodity. So the first one is that we have seen the Marxification of capitalism. Okay. What do I mean by the Marxification of capitalism? Well, Del Noche pointed out that during the Cold War in the United States in the 50s, we began to see a shift. The United States leaders used to speak about resistance to communism in moral terms and in Christian terms. But what happened is they began to shift and they began to talk about beating communism on terms of productivity, liberation, and sexual liberation. Okay. But these are Marxist values. So very slowly, Marxist values became the approach which, which the United States was going to defeat the Soviet Union. So when the Berlin Wall fell, Everyone was very enthusiastic. Oh, globalization, capitalism has won the day. Democracy's won the day. We've come to the end of history. Okay. But we made a mistake because we identified, as I said earlier, Marxism with its economic aspects alone. While we slowly embraced Marxian cultural values. And so today in the United States, ideas that would have been thought radical 70 years ago, are normal. Marxist ideas that would have been thought radical are normal in the United States and Europe. Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI said, quote, we must be aware this in the nineties, early nineties, we must be aware that Marxism was only the radical execution of an ideological concept that even without Marxism largely determines the signature of our century. And so we have Marxified capitalism. So Del Noche said before he died in 1989, he said communism failed in the East while it realized itself in the West. Okay. Not economic communism, but cultural and social anthropological Marxism. So this, he says also because he argues, Del Noche argues that the sexual revolution is the extension of Marxism, right? It's an extension of the radical freedom and the dehumanizing breakdown of the family, get rid of this form of marriage that's part of the Marxian vision. Because remember, there are three primary obstacles to Marxist th to socialist reform, okay? Private property, religion, and this present form of marriage. And so what you see is the sexual revolution as the extension of Marxism. And then the third element is the, how the cultural revolutionary became a technocratic capitalist. Uh, what Del Noche says is the hippie became a yuppie. All right. So um, if you remember in the 1960s, there's this whole kind of hippie movement. Everybody's got long hair. They reject tradition. They reject family and they reject technology and they kind of go back to the earth and they're waiting for the age of Aquarius to come. They're waiting for the, the eschaton and all the perfect time. And when the age of Aquarius did not come, the hippie became a yuppie, a young, upwardly mobile professional who continued the rejections of tradition, but embraced technology and anything consumerist. And so what Del Noche points out is that Happiness for the yuppie is something to be purchased. And at that point, every single thing becomes an object of trade. Everything, happiness can be bought. So our bodies, our sperm, our eggs, our wombs, anything can be bought and sold and traded. There's no, everything becomes inside of a market. So very interestingly, the people who hate capitalism also want markets for morally evil things. Notice it's an ironic position. They want the government to control all the elements and they don't want free economies, except they want markets for wombs and eggs and sperm and people. Because everything becomes an object of trade. And so I support free competitive market economies, but just because there's a market for something doesn't mean there should be a market for something. Markets must always be underneath a an anthropological and moral, ethical, cultural vision. 
but the moral and cultural vision of the of the of the 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 hippie who's become a yuppie is everything is for sale and so you see as Don Oche argues this actually affects modesty because nudity and immodest clothes is just an advertisement and so if you wonder like oh there's a decrease in modesty of course there is because we live in what Del Noche calls pure bourgeois Christian bourgeois is rejected and pure bourgeois is accepted so I want to make an important point in this critique there's no simple economic solution to our problem because this is not an, an economic policy issue it's a intellectual cultural spiritual problem because it's a bad vision of the human person so let me just then uh, conclude i would say um, i've set out for you five false anthropologies to kind of give a landscape of the world we live in and if we're going to address questions about markets and politics and culture and society we have to be aware that we are on deep cultural and philosophical grounds and debate and so i would say in conclusion that we have to address politics we have to address economics we have to address culture but we also have to make the case for a positive view of the human person that each person is created in the image of God, that being is good, that our bodies are good. Our bodies are not something to escape from. This is why the creed says we have the resurrection of the body, right? That we have a social nature. We're not radical individuals. That our freedom has a purpose. The dominant view of freedom today is just exercise your will. But imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if I started banging my head on this podium and blood squirted out everywhere, not one person in the room would say, wow, Michael is very free. No one would think that because an irrational will is not a free will. We have to recover the idea of freedom, recover the idea of the goodness of our body, recover the idea of the goodness of our social relationships and the family, because ultimately the, the problem of despair and the problem of technocracy is that we have lost a beautiful and elegant vision of the human person. So thank you for your time.